This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. We welcome you to lesson number eight in our continuing series as we survey world religions. And our lesson today is entitled Buddhism, The Path to Enlightenment, and this is part two of the series on Buddhism. Buddhism, The Path to Enlightenment. I hope that you're enjoying our study together. I've certainly enjoyed preparing for this class, and I'm enjoying it very much to have the opportunity to present it and to teach it to people such as you in different places, people that I may never meet in this life, but I hope to meet in the world to come. I would like to recommend to you some of the materials that I have used in preparing this class. Many years ago, when I was a student in college, I took a course called Comparative Religions, and for the first time I was exposed to a study of uh, religions other than Christianity. Then, when I lived in Africa, I had opportunity to come in contact with uh, people from India who were Hindus and with Africans who were Muslims, and so I became acquainted firsthand with those who held different religious beliefs. And since that time, I've traveled in many places and met and studied with those of various religions, but I still need to learn and to study. There's a very uh, handy book on this subject, it is written from the Christian viewpoint. Now, the two men who wrote it are not members of the Lord's Church. Uh, they are denominationalists who have Calvinistic leanings, and therefore they say some things which are not true themselves. But uh, the book is a very good, brief study of religions other than Christianity from the standpoint of the Christian viewpoint or the Bible. The book is entitled Understanding non-Christian religions. It was written by Josh McDowell, who is a well-known denominational writer who has written a lot on Christian evidences, and he was associated with someone else by the name of Don Stewart in writing this book. But it is a very simple book. It's a straightforward book. It gives the basic facts of the world religions, the basic history of them, and then makes a brief contrast of those religions with Christianity. Unfortunately, in the contrast, you have the denominational doctrines, the false doctrines held by the men who wrote the book uh, coming in. There is another book that is, I find, quite good. It's called World Religions from Ancient History to the Present. It was written by Jeffrey Perinder, an Englishman. Jeffrey Perinder it was originally published in London and it is now published in the United States in New York by Facts on File publication. But it is also a good book. One book that I don't have with me today, but I have used quite extensively through the years in studying world religions, is simply called Man's Religions. Man's Religions. This book was written originally, I think, back in the 1930s by John B. Noss. John B. Noss, N-O-S-S. Uh, Mr. Noss uh, redid the book, revised it many times. It went through many, many printings. And finally, after his death, his brother, David Noss, has revised it again and kept it in print. It is regarded as a classic study of world religions, and it is used in a number of universities, of which I'm aware, as a textbook in world religions. Now, it is not written from the Christian viewpoint. It is written simply as a man who views all religions of the world and he views them as if he doesn't believe in any of them and he simply approaches them for, as an outsider and attempts to be objective in his treatment of them. Those are books that are helpful in further study of world religions. I hope also that uh, as you study this course you will want to get a copy of my notes that I'm presenting in the class. Uh, they will be made available to you. And you should also be taking extensive notes yourself. But now let's look at our second lesson in Buddhism, which is entitled to uh, The Path to Enlightenment. 
Uh, this is the desire and the aim and the claim of Buddhism that it leads one to enlightenment, which leads one to nirvana. Buddhism, as we learned in our last lesson, originated in India in the 6th century before Jesus Christ was born. The founder of Buddhism was Siddhartha Gautama. Siddhartha Gautama, he was born, it is believed, about 560 B.C. He was born in what is now the country of Nepal, which is north of India. Buddhism grew out of Hinduism, the major religion in India, but it has some major differences with it, although it shares many things in common. Gautama became the Buddha, or the Enlightened One, when after many years of bodily abuse and meditation, he attained nirvana, he said, as a result of meditating under the bow tree. Uh, the goal of Buddhism is to achieve nirvana. At the time that one achieves nirvana, it is believed he has conquered all of his fleshly desires, and therefore he's going to be released from the cycle of rebirths. When he dies and goes into the next, uh, or his soul goes beyond, it will not be reborn again in this world, but rather his soul will merge with the great soul or spirit of the universe and will cease to exist as an individual entity. Buddha taught that the way to nirvana is the middle path. He said those who go to the extreme of rigid asceticism, that is, they deprive their body of its basic needs, uh, they do not wash or feed the body or care for the body, uh, they abuse it in various ways. He said that's the wrong way, although he himself had followed that way. He said, on the other hand, the very opposite was certainly not the right way, that of sensual indulgence in which one uh, lavishes much attention on his body and attempts to fulfill all the lust and desires of the flesh. He says both of these are extreme. There is a path in between. The middle way or the middle path, this is the way to achieve enlightenment. Now in our lesson, this after, in our lesson today, we're going to notice three things particularly. Number one, we want to look at the growth and divisions of Buddhism. Number two, we will examine the sacred scriptures of Buddhism. And finally, as we conclude the study of Buddhism, we will contrast Buddhism with Christianity. First of all, let us notice the growth and divisions of Buddhism. The growth and divisions of Buddhism. The earliest growth of Buddhism was in India where Buddhism began and it continued to grow for uh, two or three hundred years very extensively in India. Uh, it, it came about in India during a time when people were very much disillusioned with Hinduism. They felt that Hinduism was not answering their needs and so they were receptive to a new religion and yet a religion that would be similar to that which they already believed. And so this provided great opportunity for Buddhism to grow. The early type of Buddhism that originated in India and flourished there was called Theravada Buddhism. Theravada Buddhism. Now Theravada Buddhism is the original type of Buddhism, early Buddhism, that which was practiced in India in the early history of this religion. By the third century before Christ, Theravada Buddhism had split into several different factions. And of course, there have been many divisions since that time. The Muslims invaded India in the 13th century, and wherever the Muslims go, they spread their religion, or wherever they went, they spread their religion by means of the sword. And so Islam became a major religion in India particularly in the part of the nation where Buddhism was strongest. And because of this, Buddhism largely has died out in India, the land of its birth. Now, Buddhism is a major religion. We have pointed out that it is one of the three universal religions, the other two being Islam and Christianity. That is, it is found in almost any place in the world, but strangely enough, it has largely died out in India, 
the nation of its birth. The other major type of Buddhism is called Mahayana Buddhism. Mahayana Buddhism. Mahayana Buddhism developed in China and Japan. Missionaries went out from India in the early days of the movement to other Asian nations and established Buddhism in those nations. And two of the nations in which Buddhism flourished for many, many years were China and Japan. Uh, the uh, Buddhist movement in China, of course, has been brought to a virtual standstill by the communist regime, which has controlled that nation since the 1940s. In Japan, Buddhism still flourishes in various forms, but uh, Buddhism is, um, doesn't have the hold, perhaps, upon the secular-minded Japanese people today that it once did. But the type of Buddhism that is practiced there is called Mahayana Buddhism. Now, those who hold to Mahayana Buddhism have a concept of a person who is called, and I will try to pronounce this, although I may not pronounce it correctly, but is called Abadhisattvas. Abadhisattva. Abadhisattva is one who uh, is at the point that he can achieve nirvana, but he postpones achieving nirvana in order to be of assistance to others by means of teaching, instruction, and encouragement who also are trying to achieve nirvana. It is taught that a bodhisattvas can become a Buddha. Uh, Buddha means an enlightened one, just in the same way that Gautama did. Another form of Buddhism that is well known in, in my part of the world, in the Western world, particularly in the United States, is called Zen, Z-E-N or Z-E-N, Zen Buddhism. It's a form of Mahayana Buddhism, and it has become very popular in Europe and America in recent years. Now, Zen is a more recent development of Buddhism. It probably began about a thousand years after the death of Buddha. It has no writings that it regards as sacred scriptures. Those who hold to the Zen philosophy of Buddhism say that their beliefs do not need to be explained. They can be transmitted directly from, excuse me, from one mind to another. Well, that seems rather strange to me, but that is the claim that they make. And because of that, they do not feel a need for having scriptures. In Zen Buddhism, a lot of emphasis is placed upon meditation. And, of course, they meditate with a goal in mind of attaining enlightenment. And so they spend a great deal of time in meditation, and that is the prevailing practice in Zen Buddhism. One of the interesting things about Zen Buddhism, at least I find interesting, is that they frequently repeat this statement that they attribute originally to Gautama, the original Buddha. And the statement is, Look within, you are the Buddha. Look within, you are the Buddha. What do they mean by that? What are they saying? They're saying that each person potentially can become enlightened, therefore an enlightened one, and therefore a Buddha. Gautama, who lived in the, uh, before Christ some five to six hundred years, is not the only one who can be a Buddha. There have been other Buddhas, other enlightened ones, and each of us can become an enlightened one if we meditate, if we look within. Well, let us move on now to the sacred scriptures of Buddhism. The sacred scriptures of Buddhism. Nearly all world religions have scriptures. Not all, but nearly all do. Uh, Buddhism does not place the emphasis upon scriptures uh, that others do, particularly Christians and Muslims, but they do have, at least Theravada Buddhism, has sacred books called scriptures. They have three groups of scriptures, and together these three groups of scriptures are referred to as, and I'll try to pronounce this correctly, as the Tripitaka, the Tripitaka. What is the Tripitaka? Well, that is a word I understand that means simply three baskets, three baskets, 
and it probably indicates in ancient times before writings were put together in book form that the scrolls or the tablets upon which these ancient scriptures were first written filled three baskets. And so they have three sections, and they're called tripitaka, which means three baskets. The tripitaka, or the three baskets, the sacred scriptures of Buddhism, are very extensive. Our English Bibles, our Christian Bibles, I should say, the Bible, the Word of God that we use, has 66 books. 66 books that together make one book, the Bible. And it's a handy-sized book. It's one that can be printed between two covers, and it's easy for us to carry it about with us. One cannot do that with the Tripitaka. It is about 11 times the size of the Bible. And so printed today, it would make 11 volumes this size. I think one of the reasons that God did not make the Bible larger than he did, first of all, it wasn't necessary, but uh, secondly, he wanted to make it possible for us to be able to study it and study it extensively and find it very useful, and of course we are, but if it were 11 times that size, it would be much more difficult. The Tripitaka can, includes the sayings of Buddha, or at least sayings that traditionally have been attributed to Buddha. We cannot always know for sure that they are authentic. It also includes lectures on how one is to discipline himself and lectures on philosophy. Mahayana Buddhism, uh, in contrast to Theravada Buddhism, has no fixed canon of scripture. Now by the word canon, we mean a rule by which it is determined uh, that certain books are sacred or scripture and others are not. In Mahayana Buddhism, there is no fixed rule by which one can determine what is to be considered sacred scripture and what is not. And so they have more than 5,000 volumes of writings, religious writings. The number continues to grow, and these are all regarded in a certain sense as being sacred. In exactly what sense, I am not sure, but my understanding is that they do not quite look upon these writings in the same way that we look upon the Bible as being the inspired Word of God uh, revealed to us. Buddhism makes a very interesting comparison to Christianity. There are many great differences between Buddhism and Christianity, just as there are many great differences between uh, Christianity and Islam or Christianity and Hinduism. Now, as we began our study together, you'll remember that I said in the beginning, and I've repeated it since, that I am a Christian. I believe the Bible is the inspired, unerring Word of God. I believe that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God who was born of a virgin, who lived upon this earth, who performed miracles, who was crucified on the cross, and by His death on the cross shed His blood in payment for my sins that I might go free. I believe that He was buried, but that He arose from the dead the third day. This is well attested historically. And I believe he ascended back to heaven and I further believe as the Bible teaches that one day he's coming again to raise the dead, to destroy the earth, and to judge all who have ever lived. So I believe that. And so as I approach the study of world religions, I'm trying to be fair and kind and honest and objective, but at the same time, I'm a Christian. And I believe Christianity, true Christianity, is the only way. And these religions are false religions, and therefore we must teach those who are blinded by them the truth of the gospel that they might also know the salvation that we know and enjoy. And so we contrast these religions as we, as we study with Christianity so that you will see the difference. We hope that by doing this, that as a Christian, your faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and your belief in the Holy Scriptures will be made stronger and also that you will be better prepared to go out and to teach others who have been misled by these foreign religions 
far, when I say foreign, I mean foreign to the Bible. Uh, these religions, you'll be able to teach them uh, the precious gospel of Jesus Christ that they can be saved. Buddhism and Christianity are so different that they can hardly be prepared, uh, compared in one way, but in another sense, the contrast between the two is very great. Let's point out, first of all, that Buddhism essentially is atheistic. Buddhism essentially is atheistic. Now, keep in mind in our last lesson that we studied about the gods of Buddhism, and we pointed out that Buddha himself accepted the fact that there were many gods and that there were devils or demons, but he believed that these gods and these demons were bound to the a wheel of rebirth to Sangsara, just like living human beings and living animals were, all living beings were, and they had to be reborn again and again and again. And so that was his idea of the gods. He did not encourage his disciples or followers to pray to the gods because he did not believe the gods had anything that they could do for them in helping them to become enlightened and to attain nirvana. The gods themselves had to work toward this end because they also were tied to the wheel of rebirth. Uh, and so Buddhism has become basically atheistic. Uh, gods generally are not worshipped by Buddhists, but there are some sects of Buddhism that do worship some gods or various gods. And it's interesting that many Buddhists worship Gautama Buddha the original enlightened one himself as a god. Now, he would not have encouraged that. In fact, he would have discouraged that. But that is done by actually millions of followers of Buddhism today. And so Buddhism basically is atheistic. However, there are those who worship Buddha as a god. Those who worship Buddha as a god, and that's contrary to Buddha's own teaching, but those who worship him as a god are guilty of idolatry. They're guilty of idolatry in doing that. Those that are atheistic, of course, are guilty of denying the existence of God. You know, the Bible makes this statement, uh, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. The Bible points out that the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. It points out that God's uh, divinity, his everlasting power and Godhead can be seen in the very things which he has made. One has to be foolish indeed to deny that which he himself can see and feel and touch and experience. One can go out and look round about him. He can see the beautiful mountains. He can see the deep, rolling sea. He can see the beautiful streams that flow. He can see the birds that sing and see the sun in the day and the moon and the stars at night. He can watch trees and plants as they grow. He can experience the pleasure of the rain falling and smell the good smell of that upon the earth. And he can know that all of these are things which man cannot do. Man is incapable of creating or making all of these. Now, if one sees a house, he doesn't say, wonder how that house got to be there. Wonder how it just happened to be there. He doesn't say that. He knows that where there's a house, there is implied a builder. And so when we look at the world around us where there's such a great world, human beings are not capable of doing this. We know that the existence of the building, the earth, indicates a creator or a builder. And so our own senses declare to us the existence of a God or supreme being. One has to be a fool truly to deny this. Of course, we must go to the Bible to learn what the divine being is like and what his will is for us to do. But the Bible teaches that God is eternal. That is, he lives forever. In Psalm 90 and verse 2, uh, Moses wrote, and this psalm is attributed to Moses, he says, From everlasting to everlasting thou art God. The Bible teaches that God is immutable. That is, he does not change. We can rely upon our God 
Uh, he doesn't change his mind or his opinion about things. Uh, when he tells us something, he, we know that he will keep his word. Malachi 3.6 says, I, the Lord, change not. And Hebrews 13.8 tells us concerning Jesus Christ that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Again, our God is omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent. By omnipresent, we mean that he's everywhere. By omniscient, we mean that he's all-wise or all-knowing. By omnipotent, we mean that he's all-powerful. And these attributes of God are taught throughout Scripture. God is the creator of all things. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But furthermore, our God is a creator of man who is personally concerned about man. He is our Father. He loves man. And He has made it possible for man to be saved from his sins. Why anyone would want to trade the concept of a loving God who explains how we came to be for a belief in no God at all or for the worship of a mere man such as Buddha is really something I don't understand. A second contrast between Buddhism and Christianity is that Buddhism has no concept of sin. Buddhism has no concept of sin and therefore they do not see the need of a Savior from sin. Now in order to teach a Buddhist the gospel of Christ, we must first make him aware of the fact that he is a sinner. We must first make him aware of the fact that he is a sinner. I think that one of the reasons that our efforts to teach the gospel fail so often or perhaps seem to fall on deaf ears anyway is because we're preaching a message of salvation from sin and the people to whom we're preaching do not have an understanding or an appreciation of sin, of what sin really is. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4 tells us that whosoever committeth sin doeth also lawlessness, and sin is a transgression of the law. God has given us a law, a standard, and if we fail to live up to that standard, if we transgress that law, we become guilty of sin. Well, is that bad? Yes, indeed it is. Do you remember in Genesis chapter 3, it's recorded that Adam and Eve had been given a law by God. Of all the trees of the garden, thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is in the midst of the garden, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die, they were told. What happened? Satan came into the garden he tempted Mother Eve. She ate of the forbidden fruit. She gave it to her husband. He also ate of it. And God had to carry out His penalty against them. They had sinned. They had transgressed the righteous commandment of God. What happened to them? Well, they were driven from the Garden of Eden where they had access to the Tree of Life. The way to the Garden of Eden was uh, guarded so that they could not enter therein again. They lost that sweet fellowship they had with the Heavenly Father and they were separated from Him because of their sin and they lost access to the tree of life and therefore death came to them. Sin separates us from God. It separates us from God in this life and it will separate us from God throughout all eternity unless we take advantage of the means that God has provided and have our sins forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. The prophet Isaiah said, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that he cannot hear, but your sins have separated between you and your God, and your iniquities have hid his face from you that he will not hear. That's Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 tells us, For the wages of sin is death. And Revelation 21 verse 8 speaks of that death, that second death, as hell or the lake of fire. And so sin is a terrible thing. But the Buddhists have no concept of sin. And therefore they see no need of a Savior. That means then that the Buddhists are going to die in their sins unless the gospel of Jesus Christ can be preached to them. They can be made aware of their sins 
and obey Jesus so that they can be forgiven. Christ died for our sins, but the idea in Buddhism is that one doesn't worry about sin. He simply attempts to achieve nirvana by human works or works of his own devising. Then another contrast between Buddhism and Christianity is in uh, Bo the Buddhist concept of man. Buddhism believes that man is essentially worthless and will eventually cease to exist. Now let me talk a little bit about that, lest you think I'm being unfair in mentioning that. Buddhism believes that man is essentially worthless and will eventually cease to exist. That is, they believe that man, as far as this life is concerned, does not have a great deal of innate value. Uh, his soul is here. His soul's important. When he dies, his soul is going to be reborn again in some other form, and this will go on and on and on until such a time as he becomes enlightened and then attains nirvana. And at that time, his soul loses its individuality and goes into, if you will, oblivion as it merges into the great soul of the universe. Well, uh, that's Buddhism, similar to Hinduism. But the Bible teaches that man is made in the image of God, Genesis 1.27. The Bible teaches that man is more than body, that man is really, we might say, a triune being, that is, a being made up of three parts. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23, the Apostle Paul, in closing his letter to the Thessalonian Christians, uh, pronounced this benediction upon them. He said, The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless at his coming. Notice he referred to the entire man. He said, Your whole soul and spirit and body. The body is the physical part of us that dies and returns to the dust. Sometimes spirit and soul are considered as one uh, or used interchangeably. Other times uh, they are spoken of as separate entity. And when they're spoken of as separate entity, it may be that one has reference to the life force or life principle within us, while the other has reference to his consciousness, which is the part of him that lives on and on when life on earth is over. But the Bible teaches that man continues to live as an individual. When life on earth is over, his spirit goes to uh, the Hadean wo world where it awaits the resurrection and the judgment, and from there it will go either to heaven or hell, depending upon whether or not he has been a Christian and how he has lived upon this earth. Matthew 25, verse 46, makes it very clear that the soul is immortal and spends eternity either in heaven or in hell. Another contrast between Buddhism and Christianity is that Buddhism teaches that the body, the human body, is a miserable hindrance. Buddhism teaches that the human body is a miserable hindrance. Now, friends, I can admit that there are times sometimes when the body gives us trouble. It takes effort to feed and clothe the body and to keep it clean and to exercise and to take care of it so that the body can maintain good health. As one gets older, uh, the body becomes weaker. That happens to all of us. I was relating today to uh, some of the Christians with whom I was eating a story told by Brother Bill Jackson, a gospel preacher. He said when he was 60 years old, he made the statement, he said, when you get to be my age, not all the parts of the body work, and those parts that do hurt. Well, that does happen as one gets older. And yet the body is a wonderful creation of God, and it should be regarded in that light. He, again, we read that God created man from the dust of the earth and blew in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. The Bible teaches further that as far as Christians are concerned, the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit uh, which we have from God. Paul wrote to the Christians at Corinth and he said, 
What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own, for you were bought with a price? Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That's 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, and I'm quoting from the King James Version of 1611. But our bodies are the dwelling place of the Spirit of God. Then another contrast between Christianity and Buddhism is that Buddhism teaches reincarnation where an individual may be born and die many times before he attains nirvana. Buddha is said to have lived 530 lives, 42 times as a god, 85 times as a king, 24 times as a prince, 22 times as a scholar, twice as a thief, once as a slave and a gambler, many times as a lion, once each as a horse, eagle, bull, snake, and a frog. But the Bible teaches something entirely different. The Bible does not teach that man has many lives, that he's born again and again and again, but the Bible teaches man has but one lifetime upon this earth. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, we read that it is appointed unto man once to die, and that is a word in the original Greek which carries the idea of once for all. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. So friends, when our spirits leave our bodies and we are dead, then the next major thing, major event in our existence will be the judgment of God. It's not appointed unto man to live and to die over and over and over again, but it's appointed unto man once to die. Friends, you cannot believe in the Bible and believe in reincarnation. The two are contrary to one another, and you're going to have to give up one or the other in order to be consistent. The Apostle John from the island of Patmos uh, spoke of a vision he had and how the Spirit had said unto him, Right blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Revelation 14 and 13. And so when we die, uh, our works follow us into the next life. That is, we're going to be judged upon the basis of our works. And none of the works that we have done, uh, none of the good that we've done will certainly have been in vain. But that is what happens to us once life on earth is over. Another contrast between Buddhism and Christianity is that Gautama Buddha was just an ordinary man. Gautama Buddha presented no evidence that he told the truth or anything else but that he was just an ordinary man. Now friends, Christianity is a historical religion. It can be proven historical. The life of Jesus Christ was the most extraordinary life that was ever lived. Jesus fulfilled more than 300 prophecies which had been made hundreds and hundreds of years before he was born. Jesus worked miracles, including raising the dead. And this was done in the presence of witnesses, in the presence even of his enemies, who would have delighted to have been able to disprove what he did. But his miracles proved that he was indeed the Son of God. But the great crowning miracle of all was his resurrection from the dead. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 4, that he was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. And so Jesus was more than a man. He was a man, but he was more than a man. He was the very Son of God. And he proved it by the miracles that he worked and the life, the sinless life that he lived. Finally, Another contrast, and a final contrast we'll notice between Buddhism and Christianity is that the goal of Buddhism is to attain nirvana. The goal of Buddhism is to attain nirvana, that is, to cease to exist as a separate entity, but the goal of the Christian is everlasting life in heaven with God. Buddha died at the age of 80. Jesus Christ died at the age of 33. But Jesus was raised from the dead after three days, some 40 days, he spent on the earth teaching his apostles, and then he ascended back to heaven with the promise that 
Just as he ascended into heaven, one day he would come again. He's going to come again to raise the dead, judge all men, and destroy the earth. Buddhism teaches that life is merely drudgery to be endured, but Christianity gives real meaning and purpose both to life and to death. As I grow older, and as I realize that I'm getting closer to death, of course, death could come to any of us at any time, but as one grows older, he knows he's getting closer to it. As one man, a Christian man, used to say, the old must die and the young may. But as I grow older, I'm thankful more and more that I'm a Christian and that in death, I actually will gain a victory. Only in obedience to Jesus Christ can one find forgiveness of sins and the hope of everlasting life. In our next lesson, we will study Shintoism, a religion of Japan. This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory.